ago, I attended the Bud Billiken Parade, and what a joy it was. What a joy it was to see so much love and joy, creativity and positivity. It was good for me personally to be there. It was good for my soul and for my spirit. I saw Grace. Grace, I don't know if you know, I saw you. I saw you there. Did you enjoy it as well? It was an amazing, amazing experience. It's always good to be reminded that there are some things that are right with the world, right in our communities and in our cities. There is so much good in people. The Bud Billiken Parade is an amazing annual display of the good, and I recommend it to you. As a preacher who keeps a newspaper in one hand and a Bible in another, and I left my props back there, but Pastor Sarah, lift up the newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other, as encouraged by theologian Karl Barth, there are daily reminders, thank you, Pastor Sarah, of the wrong that is happening in our world. As Christians, we must stay abreast of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Not only should we stay abreast of the good and the bad, I believe all of us have the ability to influence for good and, unfortunately, for bad and for the ugly. As Christians, I believe that our faith calls us to first realize we have the power of influence and that we are called to use it for good. If you were here for my last sermon, Faith for What? By faith, we can change the world, starting with our corner of it. Businessman Anito Kubain put it this way, are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat? A thermometer only reflects the temperature of its environment adjusting to the situation, but a thermostat initiates action to change the temperature in the environment. Don't care much for quotes from businessmen? Well then, hear Jesus when he says in his Sermon on the Mount, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Jesus continues, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Jesus says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify God in heaven. And some of you remember, every time we read that text, we remember a sermon from Pastor Sarah. It stays with me, Pastor Sarah. Thank you for the sermon, that Je uh, uh, echoing Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that we are both called to be, not us both, but we're both called, all of us are called to be both salt and light. The question each person in this room must ask themselves is, do I believe I can make an impact? On what? On anyone or anything. Start here, on anything within your purview that you know is wrong. With the newspaper in one hand, you see the needs of the world. And with the Bible in the other hand, you see a God who created the world and a Jesus who tells us we are both salt and light. And after so many years as a Christian, do you believe you, the person sitting in your pew, do you believe you've been called, not just called, but positioned, set up to change one thing? We have more power than we realize, and the good news is that if there's still breath in your body, everybody inhale, exhale. That means everyone under the sound of my voice. 
the good news is that you can still make an impact for good. Now, I recall debates in seminary about not becoming self-righteous like you have the answer and can make things better. But here's the deal. Those who want to have an evil influence don't go around second-guessing whether they have the right to have an evil influence in society. They just do it. From social media, to music lyrics, to bomb threats that are currently terrorizing the students of Howard University, those who want to have a negative influence don't seem to hold back nor second guess their ability to have that influence. They seem to relish in the fact that they have the power to do bad and they just do it. While those of us who want to do good in the world or can do good in the world sit back and ponder whether we have the ability to influence things for good, whether we should do it or whether we feel like doing it, and if we're really deep, we ponder whether it's our right to do so. We could mentor a young person, but we don't. We could say something when we see mistreatment on the street, but we, we don't. We could write and call our elected officials, but we don't. We could serve those in need, but not let somebody else do it. My Bible says in Isaiah 40 and 31, those who hope in the Lord, I think that's all of us, shall renew our strength, that we shall mount up on wings like eagles, that we shall run and not get weary, that we shall walk and not faint. And we don't need all that energy and eagle-like soaring ability to do nothing. If we're inactive and doing nothing, there's a call there in Isaiah and pretty much every text in the Holy Scriptures that are calling and compelling us to do something. The book of Esther calls God's people to a sense of purpose for something other than ourselves and bigger than ourselves. And maybe, just maybe, God has positioned you and purposed you for such a time as this. And what a time it is. What a time it is when young women feel the need to conceal and carry because young men get violent just because a woman says no. What a time it is when communities in which we've lived our whole lives now seem unsafe and we feel more vulnerable than ever. What a time it is when young people disrespect their elders and think absolutely nothing of it. What a time it is when churches are emptier than they've ever been. What a time it is when, when there are more guns in our society than people. What a time it is when, when you have to think twice about going to an outdoor crowded event for fear of a shooter. What a time it is today, August 28, 2022, 59 years to the day of the March on Washington. When those who felt then that Dr. King's dream was their worst nightmare have reemerged to the mainstream to the detriment of democracy. What a time it is. We're living in some strange and dangerous times and I implore you not to lose touch with the times. Because who knows, perhaps you have come to your current position, station in life, or location in life for just such a time as this. These are the words from our scripture today spoken by Mordecai to his cousin and adopted daughter, Queen Esther. Please allow me to set the context. The book of Esther is the book in the Old Testament that explicitly displays the object, objectification and exploitation of women. As King Ahasuerus calls his queen, Queen Vashti, to come and be on display, possibly naked, only wearing a crown, before his guests to the banquet so he can show both power over her and her beauty. Queen Vashti says, no. Women 
have been resisting this since biblical days for thousands of years. So how some segments of the Christian faith still denounce women leadership, deplore women's voices, and exploit women's bodies while they claim to believe in God's word is beyond me. It's right in the text. Young men are still doing it today, objectifying women and getting mad when they say no. So pardon my sidebar, but there's an opportunity right there for someone to do good. Teach young men within your reach how to treat women and how to treat others. And you will have had influence for good. The story progresses to be about another young woman, Esther who attains royal status to replace Queen Vashti. You do know if you speak up, you risk being replaced. She was cast aside in punishment for saying no. Long story short, Esther, Jewish orphan girl, now young woman, becomes queen of Persia to the same king, Ahasuerus. But her Jewish identity is hidden. Esther has gone from being a little orphan girl to being a queen. She's gone from poverty to wealth, from having nothing to having everything. She has maid servants at her beck and call. She gets all the cosmetic perfume and bodily care treatments that a girl could ever want. She's got all the shoes, purses, jewelry, clothes, and servants, you name it, she has it. And it all just happened to her unexpectedly. She was chosen to be queen, and all this stuff was part of the package. Call that privilege. And just as she's getting used to being the queen of Persia, something transpires. You can read it for yourself when you read it at home, and now there's a plan in place to destroy the Jewish people. Genocide of the Jewish people is about to take place with the king's permission, and the king doesn't know that Esther is Jewish. Queen Esther adopted, her adopted father Mordecai wants Esther to go before the king, reveal her identity as a Jew, and stop this plan of destruction of the Jewish people. Queen Esther finds herself at a fork in the road, and, and this is where the, today's text picks up with Esther's initial response to Mordecai. Verse 11, Esther says, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter. I hear you, Holy Spirit, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called, at least by not that king. That's what's coming to me that didn't come to me when I was preparing. Anyway, I'm sorry. Esther is saying to Mordecai, do you realize what you're asking me to do? That you're asking me to risk my life, it's likely that, that Esther's also thinking, and even if the king doesn't kill me, do you realize I could lose my status and all my stuff? Mordecai? Mordecai, do you realize what you're asking me to do? Mordecai called it right. He knew that Esther might choose to remain silent, seeing that she had too much to lose brings to mind a quote from Dr. King. He said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. I'm sure Dr. King experienced the silence of his friends who did not want to be bothered. I'm sure he, he experienced the silence of friends who did not want to risk being seen at the march. I'm sure he experienced the silence of his friends who did not want to risk their lives nor their livelihood who did not want to risk their power nor their privilege. Silence must have really bothered Dr. King, for he's quoted as saying, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Dr. King kept it real with his friends. Mordecai kept it real with Esther. And I need to keep it real with you. Church, big C, little C, whatever C you want to imagine, we, the church, have been silent. 
We've been silent about poverty and silent about homelessness. We've been silent about January 6th and silent about the war in Ukraine. We've been silent about Roe versus Wade, silent about gun violence, and silent about the pervasiveness of guns, period, in our violent society. The church has been silent about health disparities and silent about housing disparities and silent about economic disparities and the enormous wealth gap in our society. Call those root causes for violence. We've been silent. We've been silent about student loan debt and now we're probably going to be silent about the resistance to student loan debt forgiveness. We're silent about things that matter. As people of faith and people of God, we should not be silent. So Mordecai challenged Esther to not remain silent. It's in the text. I'm only preaching the word. He says, do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. If you remain completely silent, he says, Relief and deliverance will come. Hallelujah. Some of us know that God's going to do what God's going to do with us or without us. I always say God can do what God's going to do without the church, but God would rather use us. It enriches our life when we're used by God. We're not doing God a favor. We're doing ourselves good by helping someone else. He says, yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, Mordecai is saying, Esther, as I just said, God's going to do what God needs to do. But God's trying to use you. And maybe, Esther, maybe all that's happened to you, this whirlwind of favor that you've had, Maybe going from orphan to queen, from poverty to wealth, from having nothing to having at all, maybe all of this for a higher purpose than you. Maybe it was never about you, Esther. Maybe you've been blessed to be a blessing, Esther. Esther, maybe all of this is part of God's divine plan. You know, the book of Esther gets a lot of criticism because God is not mentioned once. It almost didn't make the canon because those who were making those decisions said it's not religious enough. But thank God that the Holy Spirit did what the Holy Spirit needed to do because God can be seen, the divine voice speaking through Mordecai to encourage Esther to do right by her position and her status that she got by no effort of her own. Maybe all of this is part of God's divine plan to save God's people. And Esther, just maybe you're queen in this kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai speaks prophetically to Esther and helps her open her spiritual eyes so that she can see God in her situation. And now that her spiritual eyes are open, she's no longer choosing between keeping her stuff and losing her stuff. She's now choosing between being self-centered or being God-centered. She's no longer choosing between being a Jew and being a queen. She's now choosing between staying on one level or moving to a higher level. Now that her spiritual eyes are open, Esther's no longer choosing between keeping her life and losing her life. She's choosing between doing her own will or doing God's will. See, I believe Esther's no longer at a fork in the road. I believe that fork now more looks like a ladder. See, in order to climb a ladder to one rung, you've got to let go of the rung you've been holding on to. You've got to let go of some power and some privilege. You've got to let go of that life you worked so hard to create and you just want to hold on to it a little while longer. You've got to climb up a little higher to where God is calling you for your purpose. If you're at a fork in the road in your life, I encourage you to stop seeing your situation as a fork and see it as a ladder. God wants to take you higher toward a purpose in life, but you've got to let go of the wrong you're holding on to. 
Paul said it this way, you've got to forget those things that are behind and you've got to press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Esther considered Mordecai's words. She opened her spiritual eyes and this is her final reply. She says, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. In that moment, Esther let go of her wrong of self-centeredness, and she accepted God's will for her life. And she went from being earthly minded to divinely guided. And in that moment, Esther went from sounding like an earthly queen to sounding like Christ Jesus, the king. For Esther's finally, final reply, if I perish, I perish, sounds a lot to me like not my will, but thy will be done. And that's what Jesus said before he was betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. Won't you shift with me to the Garden of Gethsemane? For that's what Jesus said before they arrested him and put him on trial and beat him all night long. That's what Jesus said before they hung him on the cross and pierced him in the side. That's what Jesus said before he gave up the ghost and died on Calvary. But we know that's not the end of the story because he got up with all power in his hands. Ages before Jesus, Esther was willing to give her life. And just like Jesus, Esther fulfilled God's purpose for her life. And I'm here today, you can call me Mordecai, to help somebody open their spiritual eyes. For God has a higher purpose for your life. You've been blessed for such a time as this. You've been privileged for just a time as this. You've been safe in the arms of Jesus for such a time as this. Your life is not a mistake. Everything that has happened to you, that has brought you to the place you're in, has been done for such a time as this. God has a purpose for each and every one of our lives, but you've got to be willing to let go of one rung in order to climb and reach for the next one. You've got to be willing to die to self. All those selfish ways before God can use you in a mighty way. I'm about to close, but John 12, 24, Jesus says, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. In other words, if you want a fruitful life, there are some ways that we have to die to. We are resurrection people. We say we believe in the resurrection, but we're so afraid to die. Jesus goes on to say in John 12, 25, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Stop holding on so tight to earthly things. Some of you all know I moved a couple of weeks ago. Right before I moved Vanessa back to Howard, I moved out of the apartment building I was in and just down the street a little bit. When you move, you realize how much stuff. Anybody with me? Please tell me I'm not by myself. We collect so much stuff like it gives us purpose to have stuff. But I'm here to tell somebody today that we can let go of stuff. It feels much better to do what God is calling us to do. Before I take my seat, I want to tell you a little bit about what happened to Queen Esther. She, she went before the king and, and because she was willing to perish, but she was willing to perish, but she kept on living. She was willing to lose it all, but she lost nothing and gained everything. She didn't lose her life. She didn't lose her wealth. She didn't lose her status. She didn't lose her beauty treatments. She didn't lose her manicures and pedicures. She didn't lose her joy. She didn't lose her peace. Now look at all she gained. She gained more power in the kingdom. Queen Esther gained more freedom in the kingdom. She could be herself. She saved the lives of her people. 
I'm here to tell someone today that God's got more for you. God's got more for your life. I don't care how young or old you are. God's got a purpose for your existence. And someone's life is depending on you. All you've got to do is go where God calls you to go. Do what God calls you to do. And if you've lost touch with that small, still voice, calm yourself a bit. Pray and meditate and say, speak to my heart, Lord. I want to hear you. I, I want more than stuff. I want purpose. And I want to help somebody. God bless you.